Welcome to the American Diversity Report podcast, where we interview change makers and diverse innovators who make a difference in our world. I am Deborah Levine, editor in chief of the American Diversity Report and your host for this podcast. And with me is a dear friend who you are going to love, <laughs> Dr. Sabine Guo. Welcome. Thank you. It is such a great honor to be here and talking with you. Wonderful. Now, he is a professor of cultural anthropology at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. He is also right, a Tai Chi expert. He knows everything. <laughs> and, <recently. laughs> uh, and I know him, I know that because I took a class for him when he first came and was kind enough to share his expertise with the community at large. So tell us, sir, how did you come to Chattanooga? But first, how did you come to cultural anthropology? Well, <clears throat> and uh... It's a long story, but I uh, try to make it as if it was yesterday. Uh, <clears throat> so when I, uh, when I arrived in the U.S. Um, back in early 80s, and my dream, of course, was to explore and the world. And uh, growing up uh, in a quiet and a culturally, socially uniformed environment, right? And uh, so, uh, had a kind of one way of thinking about lots of things. And during the early 80s, and uh, as many of people would uh, remember or aware that uh, China began to embarking on uh, uh, economic, cultural, social transformation. And uh, so suddenly, and uh, we began to learn uh, a lot of things we didn't know about uh, life and uh, thinkings and uh, social development all outside of China. And so that was the one, and I began to um, determine that uh, I want to explore. I want to understand humanity. I want to understand about life. So the opportunity arrived, and so I came to U.S. Uh, to study, and uh, also to hopefully that because I had a uh, uh, kind of confidence with my martial arts training and experiences, and uh, you know teaching, I probably can, you know, handle myself pretty well. <laughs> Well, which is uh, really good, and I met a lot of people and uh, through teaching martial arts, Tai Chi, where I was students. So one of the first people, a uh, few first people I met when I arrived uh, in stores, Connecticut, and were uh, many professors uh, from the University of Connecticut, and some of them and uh, uh, were anthropologists. So that was the first time for me to really uh, learn about uh, there is actually such a, a study or field and uh, focus on culture and outside of, you know, the discipline I was familiar with, which is history. So I became fascinated to uh, uh, listening to their stories, you know, what they tell me about and uh, and their research, their, 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 their knowledge, and their experiences, and working with people all over the world, and, uh, and to really kind of uh, and review the various ways and human uh, able to engage in uh, with their health and uh, try to understand, make a meaning of the sicknesses and health problems, uh, either biological or mental. And so that become uh, uh, my focal interest because you know I grew up as a martial artist and uh, training and uh, martial arts, especially later on when I was uh, began to be, you know, attracted to the 
overall concept of internal martial arts, which is Tai Chi is about, I began to uh, uh, realize empirically, but also cognitively, the importance of mind. And so that my first introduction of about mind is not from lectures about you know, psychology, it's not about you know, meditation, all the things, but really through martial arts. Uh, in a Tai Chi and uh, you redirect and uh, how you use your opponent's power against your opponents is based on the sense of mind. How can you uh, be tranquil and yet alert? And how can you act without, you know, and uh, action? So all those practical practices that I have had really kind of helped me to understand, wow, that is a fascinating fascinating field uh, so i began to and uh, taking serious uh, uh, seriously in in the whole field of cultural anthropology or medical anthropology in particular so then i began to study under them uh university of connecticut and um, so then my journey started from there and i understand that that journey then led you to further your research at Harvard Medical College. That's why I, I, you know, I after I uh, uh, finished my fieldwork and PhD fieldwork, and which was uh, uh, I conducted in New York and uh, New York City, okay. and uh, in that research, I learned um, a great a deal, and also was inspired. And by a lot of my study participants, which are elderly and Asian Americans, uh, including both, uh, you know, uh, elderly and migrant from China and also from India. So what I learned, what I learned was that uh, you know, at a, such a uh, life point of life, and uh, many of them. Uh, were very unfamiliar with the cultural practices, especially the medical practices, and come to America and uh, living in the uh, environment which was completely different from their traditional way of life. And the kids are busy and, uh, you know, they basically, many of them had to take care of themselves uh, in the social cultural environment uh, to them are very strange and but yet they overcome they find a way to overcome they find a way to work the you know and uh, their knowledge and especially their willingness ability to bend to to adapt to change themselves and really provide me with the great inspirations of the sense of humanity, what is humanity about? You know, if you look at study in a human, we survive so many, many years, right? Right, means not means all those years are peaceful and the piece of cake, everybody having good time, no. And oftentimes we all know the history are much brutal than the reality we have actually. This time is the golden age, right? We call it golden age. We have a great of, uh, you know, social civilized and uh, societies and uh, systems, of course, they're relative, but in America, you know, we consider we are, you know, the most and uh, advanced and in terms of our ideology, in terms of our political system, right? We all have a uh, great and uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, the advantages over many, many and societies and uh, uh, so um, but yet at some time uh, we you know also facing a lot of challenges but but so what I try to say is that the lesson I learned from my field work in New York City really gave me sense of deep much more deep understanding about the whole concept of adaptation Right, adaptation, which is also the very important elements of Tai Chi practices, yield and redirect, right, flow with it. And so, and that's why I think I, I, I carried on that kind of uh, uh, 
uh, inspiration and also what I learned from the field and to my next uh, um, stage of my life, which, you know, and uh, I was lucky to have the opportunity to become a member of team at a Harvard Medical School and the Department of Social Medicine and to study actually um, perceptions and also the way of engaging with Alzheimer and the dementia um, patients, um, especially how healthcare provider, oftentimes then back then there are family members who are either mostly daughter-in-law or daughters who provide care for parents who has who had dementia, Alzheimer. And uh, so that really gave me a very good uh, understanding of engaging uh, that kind of, uh, you know, exploration. Yeah, you have taken on some of society's most difficult issues. That's being one of them, but it's not the only one, is it? Uh, I know we've talked about your work with, with veterans. Uh, you've done it for many years and, and helped them in, in many, many ways. Tell us uh, a little bit first about those who are injured and then those with PTSD. Let's take the so, injuries first. Well, um, you know, veterans and uh, is a, 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 a part of the general population, right? And when we understand the, the veterans, we cannot and take them out of the social cultural context in which they you know uh, exist and uh, so psychological mental distress has become uh, such a challenging uh, uh, topic and also and uh, it's quite has become what quite prevalent challenges in all societies especially industrial societies and uh, of course, um, different disciplines and scholar from different disciplines will, would tend to provide different uh, perspective. And from a medical anthropological perspective, and uh, you know, I, I tend to agree is uh, how our social cultural changes tend to shape, reconfigurate our, and, uh, uh, way of appreciate life, understanding life, and also deal with life. And uh, I, over the years, I have run into so many people, they got everything, but yet, and uh, were not terribly happy. And uh, so, and uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> many people would think, you know, economic hardship, and tend to correlate with mental distress. That is true, but that is not the only reason. And so when I, uh, you know, take on the, the, the kind of a journey for me to develop uh, intervention strategies to work with the veterans, um, was because of the sense of, you know, understanding in order to develop uh, effective intervention strategy for any kind of thing. And uh, we must understand the underneath social, cultural, and uh, even emotional characteristics of the population. Uh, so to me, veterans, I have worked with a lot of veterans and uh, before I, 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 you know, and, and get on the, you know, uh, adaptive Tai Chi uh, program. I, you know, I taught martial arts Tai Chi and for many veterans. So from them, I learned they have something in common. They are enjoying the martial arts aspect of Tai Chi. So many, many people, Tai Chi can be seen as a dancing, as a meditative, uh, as just a beautiful movement. But yeah, for many veterans, they tend to relate it to the martial arts. And because I see it as a sense of the spirit of a warrior that, uh, you know, they developed over the years, right? 
and uh, which identifies themselves. So I found that uh, using Tai Chi movement as a way to engage in uh, veterans could be one of the most effective way. And uh, because this program is gonna be more than just a health intervention, right? Not just for your physical participation, not just you know, good for your body and the good of your mind, but they would have intrinsic motivation to participate in it because their sense of connection with the whole idea of warrior and uh, martial arts. So that was the beginning. I began to develop the program uh, in 19, actually, I'm sorry, 2016. Yes. Um, so I made a proposal and uh, to the US VA adaptive sports program and uh, they thought that was really a worthwhile and uh, efforts to make. Yes, I understand that you've done quite a bit of traveling in uh, doing this work with veterans, correct? Yes, yes. So the whole uh, the underneath of philosophy or, or rationale uh, of this program is that, of course, you know, no one individual could do them all, right? And, uh, but also I understand, you know, in working with the veterans, I believe that is my understanding from a cultural anthropological perspective that uh, to, to, to make a change, you have to come within. So therefore, and uh, those people who provide and uh, veterans with, with care are the best person who use the program to work with veterans because they understand veteran, right? They understand the social, cultural realities, where they come from, and also the challenges they're facing much more than the lay person, right? Once a lay person, people from outside. And uh, some people may have a great of Tai Chi experiences and uh, movement and, you know, know all more about Tai Chi. But if we want to use Tai Chi as intervention, interventive strategy, that uh, to me, that person must also understand the psychological, the physical, and the challenges, right? And the social reality the veterans live with. So, so, so therefore, the program I developed a focus on to provide, to provide training for healthcare providers within the VA medical system. So, and the, the traveling involving, and uh, uh, since 2016, and uh, I just, uh, you know, received a notification from USVA, we got funded again for next year. Oh, good. So it's a five years a row I've been funded. So over those, during the past four years, and we have provided, we call it uh, adaptive Tai Chi, a virtual Tai Chi uh, instructor, training a uh, 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 workshop for more than 400 and the uh, healthcare providers uh, working in, you know, uh, I forgot the number of uh, uh, VA, but probably around 60 VA medical centers across the country. Wow. So, and uh, those healthcare providers include, you know, psychologists, uh, clinical psychologists and social workers who are working with PTSD and population and uh, PTs, OTs, uh, RTs, recreational therapists, and nurses, and also the whole health yeah. and program uh, uh, coaches, health coaches. So it's a, vi a, 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 a variety of uh, healthcare providers within the VA medical centers. And uh, so they are m motivated and to use the program to engage in with their veteran population. So that really has been proved to be a very, very, and a great approach. Yes, uh, yeah. you know, and, uh, and you're teaching these people who in many cases have never been exposed to Tai Chi before. Right, right. Wow. So, so right, and so what it is, is this program is very unique, it's very different than, 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 than the conventional Tai Chi program. 
this program is a short, you know, and, uh, and about seven moves. But yeah, and uh, the way to develop the same, same routine of seven movements can be practiced in four different positions. And the one is in sitting position. You know, if you cannot stand up, if you have a knee problem, back problems, prevent you to, to, to do anything, you know, a movement, you're afraid of injury, sitting form. And then there is a, a standing form. You stand there, right? And the uh, so next step, and then there is a walking form. Ooh. You can just do like, uh, you know, uh, conventional Tai Chi practices. And also last one is the wheelchair, right? And uh, so the, in the wheelchair form, it's not just sitting in the wheelchair, but rather than those Tai Chi movements will integrate with the wheelchair movement, moving forward or turning left and turning 180 degrees, 90 degrees with the Tai Chi movement. So make it like a dancing. Uh, uh, so the, 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 the unique uh, uh, aspect of this practice, if uh, four people, right, four veterans or with different uh, uh, abilities, yeah. and they practice four different forms, they start together, they can synchronize the movement all together, the finish all together. So, and, uh, so that is the kind of uh, the feature of this, of, of, about this program. So where we teaching and uh, uh, training the instructors, also we focus on the narrative aspect, of, which is that to use Tai Chi as a story ah. to engage and also to create stories from veterans perspective. Ooh, so, I love so, it. <laughs> yeah. You know, that is inspired by the whole, you know, the narrative, you know, which is the cultural anthropology, right? Specialized. Yes. <laughs> and the stories are very powerful. I remember and Joseph Campbell, right? And uh, um, yes. a great deal about, uh, you know, myth and uh, those traditions. The last passage, they are about stories. And the story is a part of human life, the meaning of human life, and uh, you know the inspiration of human journey. And the modern society, I realize, you know, people are, tend to be very, very uh, rushed and uh, don't have much time to listen or to tell stories. And the story is very powerful. So, 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 you know, uh, uh, this program, I try to focus on using the similes, right, or metaphors and yeah. stories to engage in participants and uh, mentally. So uh, they no longer just be benefit physically from those gentle flowing movement, but also those movements become a story. And the story has either you redirect, right, like a bamboo, right, like a water, like a tree, like a mountains, right? Yeah, yeah. But also creates a sense of mental connection between their mind and the nature world. You know, I've studied stories since, you know, I was a freshman at, at Harvard. Oh, wow, folklore, yes, yes absolutely. The and best. and yeah. that every culture on the face of the planet has stories and for good reason. For good yeah. reason. So it's a cultural universal. What do you do with those stories? Do they tell them? Do they write them down? Do they, what do they do? Well, so what, what do we do is this, of course, you know, and uh, working with uh, um, this population, and I, I understand, you know, there, there, there are limitations. For example, I, I had uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, veterans who is in the wheelchair came to training and he was so excited he was so so excited and he did so well he says you know he told me i said why you your movement i so, you got it just like this you why your so movement is so so beautiful so powerful he says you know i i i started karate a long time ago one before i joined the army and of course, over the years, and because of injuries, right? He had he's he's waiting for a lung uh, transplant, and uh, all the health problems, PTSDs, and uh, stop him 
farm doing anything else but in the wheelchair. And uh, so coming here, and if you're like, wow, I can do this, I can do this without much of effort, but you're so powerful. So he said, I never, never dreamed about I can do martial arts again. I said, you're doing great. So third day through the training, he was absolutely the star. So what I did to him, which I made a big mistake. <laughs> In front of everybody, I said, would you lead once? Lead group practice? Because I thought that would be a great opportunity for him to feel sense of right competence and power. And I, as I was asking him, scary and his hands were shaking i was scared i i i i didn't know i didn't know what to do you know i said my god and fortunately and one of the nurses or social workers and the work with him was there and she immediately put him away and uh, you know put him chair away and walk and began to talk to him so they they they, they let on and tell me that he had uh, anxiety attack so later on he come to me he said dr go i am so sorry i said i'm so sorry i didn't know this otherwise i would not put you in that position he said no 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 i was so excited all over the years no one no one ever asked me to lead so that moment, I feel like I lost myself. I was so excited and also didn't know how to respond. So that become the trigger for his PTSD come up. So, so he was, you know, uh, but you know, that was the kind of uh, thing, um, you know, I deal with it. So, so, so my, the lesson I learned from, from working with the people is that, uh, you know, I said, okay, let's have talk about it. You know, just talk about it. And, uh, uh, you know, I would encourage them to write down, but of course I, you know, I don't usually intentionally say, hey, write down this and I want to see it. So, so I don't want to give them pressure because a lot, of it, it, you know, it's, 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 it's a very, very, uh, but also, you know, that moment, uh, everybody seemed to be so excited. You know, I would, uh, in my, in my uh, uh, training, the classes, which are also the model I developed, is that we practice Taiji, we talk about it, and we practice, you know, use different metaphors, different similes, including music, to engage in the sense of connections between their mental status of their mind and with the nature world, feel the power. But then we will spend a lot of time talk about it, have a group discussion. Mm. I understand that you're going to be applying some of this to your students at the university who probably need it very much these days, correct? Yes, absolutely. And, uh, you know, uh, if, even before the COVID-19 epidemic, uh, the mental distress among college students in the U.S., as, well, as far as we know, and has been going up, has been going up and up. And uh, so all universities has been very, very, you know, um, um, kind of uh, focus on developing programs and uh, prevention programs and uh, even counseling services and to um, help uh, the students. Of course, students are today are very different than the traditional students in many, many ways, right? And uh, many students are facing, especially here, and we know, and facing not just the challenge of academic, right, uh, uh, side, but also uh, faces challenges from many other, you know, social, economic, and families. Uh, so, and, uh, uh, so therefore, their, 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 their reality, social cultural reality is much more complex rather than just being a student. Oh, yeah. 
And uh, so today, uh, especially now the COVID-19, uh, the social isolations, loss of jobs, and uh, even students, many students tell me the inability to get together, to be in a class, and to hug your friends, to, you know, to bond it, which is the kind of lots of passage for many of us, right? Coming to university, brotherhood, sisterhood, that kind of thing. Yeah. It's really developed a social bonding, you learn from each other, deal with, to overcome. But all those things are become minimized. So, and uh, many students are really, really in a very, very, very challenging situation. And uh, so therefore, um, I worked with the University Student Wellbeing Office. We all thought this is gonna be a great, great, great effort to make and to modify the model I developed working with veterans with the PTSD and to see how they'll be perceived by students. And uh, I'm pretty confident, you know, this is gonna be a very, very and uh, exciting journey uh, for us. And uh, um, because I always believe, you know, um, life and uh, um, is in our own hands. And uh, we have, each of us would have more power than we realize, right? Of course, we rely on medical, uh, 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 you know, technology, physicians, all those things are very important, but they are not part of, a, you know, us, life. You know, there are go, you know, uh, go points if we need something, but to really, successfully effectively managing our life and uh, we have to be able to take in charge so we need more more resources and uh, so this is hopefully would be one additional and resources that many people will find um, yeah. helpful you have inspired me to um renew my practice of tai chi uh, <laughs> <laughs> and get out the uh the tape i have of you uh, uh tai chi uh, lessons and i i still see it in my mind you're outside doing tai chi uh, and i'm going to pull that up and immediately start to do it again because none of us are exempt these days from the incredible tensions and anxieties that covid has brought to our doorstep really so um uh, i think uh, i probably should have been doing more of it all along but now uh, I'm <laughs> never too late <laughs> thank you <laughs> Never too late. Never too late. Uh, this is definitely something that uh, i'm going to be doing it's just amazing the effect all of this has on your your mind and your emotions and and how that shows in our bodies and you're right we have more control over than it than we think that we yeah. realize and you have done such a wonderful job uh, I remember when I was executive director of the Jewish Federation here. Did I not bring you to the Federation? You did. Yes, did did. Yes. Session? I, that's right. I, did. I remember. I remember that. Yeah. Absolutely. I think it was maybe for the seniors. It's the seniors. That's right. The seniors. And that's it right. It's right. wonderful. Yes, yeah. indeed. Well, now that I'm one of them. <laughs> well, I mean, we all are going to be, you know, it's a yes. circle, it's a circle, we all going to be there, and so, yeah. Yeah, yep, there you go. Mm. So, tell us a little bit about uh, your, the resources that you have for people and how they can access them. Well, you know, and uh, uh, back in uh march when those you know COVID began to taking over and we had to shut down a lot of stuff a lot of uh, places including tai chi classes for veterans and uh for you know also my regular classes here 
Um, but quickly and I realized this probably was the moment and many people need the most. And of course, and uh, the availability of technology, right? The, those kind of Zoom meetings and, uh, you know, all those kind of virtual uh, platform and provide us was a great tool. So I thought, you know, I never thought about using, you know, a uh, uh, virtual and uh, engaging Tai Chi practice, but then there was only choice. Yeah. Only choice. We either do nothing or do something, right? So I decided to do something. And uh, so we began to uh, using uh, Zoom to conduct the uh, uh, adopted Tai Chi for veterans, uh, which turned out to be great. Um, so uh, uh, several veterans who, who participated in training before, but later quit because of physical conditions. They're no longer able to drive, right? Yeah. No longer able to see at night. And uh, so they stayed home. But now they can participate. That's wonderful. Yes. Because they can just sit in the living room and do with the group. So that created a great uh, opportunity uh, for me on... Um, you know, try to use uh, virtual as a way to engage in with, with, with uh, you know, not just the veterans, people of all. And uh, I just got actually, you know, an uh, email from a mother uh, who was really, really in need of those kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, program, including her son. You know, her son is eight year old and has a lot of behavior challenges, issues, and uh, they heard about Tai Chi, they really want to do it, but now, of course, there's nowhere you can go to Tai Chi classes. So she heard about the virtual classes and asked me, do you planning to open one? That would be great, right? And uh, so, and we are, I'm trying to develop some kind of uh, a manageable way uh, to engage in, to develop uh, uh, the virtual, uh, based uh, uh, intervention or whatever fitness program yeah. for people. Yeah. But also we have several websites, you know, uh, one is the appliedtaiji.com. And also we have an organization, non-profit, non-for-profit organization called uh, an Adaptive Taiji International. And also we have a Taiji community, right? The organization which all have a lot of resources and uh, provide and to you know people and also access for people to ask any questions and they have so and uh, we also have uh, you know a lot of videos um although i never never really encourage people to learn uh, tai chi through video right but tai chi video only can provide you know references uh, but at, uh, nonetheless, uh, we have those resources so if people want to learn about it, what Tai Chi is about, they can visit those places and then if they have more specific questions or needs and we can, you know, um, uh, communicate and uh, we'll be more than happy to find a way to help. Well, if you would send to me by email these, these links, uh, okay. I will add them to, uh, to uh, the, this link to your podcast and people on the American Diversity Report will be able to see exactly where they might be able to go and get help and learn uh, and it'll be wonderful and I'll send you the, the link to your page and uh, so audience wait for it it's coming soon <laughs> and we'll be able to get you involved in some way so that you can take great benefit from Dr. Guo's expertise. Is there anything else you'd like to add, sir? Well, you know, and, um, um, you know, this time of, you know, uh, what do you call life, at the point, we all realize um, there is plenty of knowledge. And uh, what seemed to be more important knowledge is to apply those knowledge into action and uh, to to really and do it and taiji is no magic bullet and uh, taiji is way uh, you know of doing it's not 
taking pillow, you know, pillow, like, you know, if I'm taking a couple of Tai Chi classes, but what I'm trying to say is not just Tai Chi, everything else. And it's really all for, you know, uh, to develop wisdom. Uh, this is a difficult time, but uh, this is not definitely not the worst, right? And confronting humanity, you know, we know, and there are a lot of people are grew up in the warfares, right? And uh, and uh, um, but this is challenging. It's not real. Those are real, but they are beatable, right? especially with the resources we have today. And uh, we believe we have this kind of ability and to overcome. To overcome, indeed. Thank you so much. I really appreciate all that you do, you have done, and sharing it with us today. Audience, I thank you for joining us. And it'll be wonderful when you uh, access your inner wisdom, as I will. <laughs> thank you again. Thank uh, you. Stay with me for a moment, Dr. Guo. Audience, I'll see you soon.